Hello students. In this video we're going to move on from naming covalent compounds now to naming ionic compounds. So we are expanding into the second of the three categories of chemical species. Recall that we've got A acids, B ionic compounds, and C covalent compounds. And we are covering those three categories in reverse order. So we've already covered the naming rules for covalent compounds, and now we're going to take a step back and cover the naming rules, the nomenclature for ionic compounds. Now just as the covalent compounds had three rules that we had to follow, ionic compounds also have three rules that we need to follow. So notice that these three rules for naming ionic compounds are different from the three rules for naming covalent compounds. And that's why before you name a compound, you have to identify which category it belongs to. You have to determine if it's A, an acid, B, ionic, or C, covalent. Because the category that the compound belongs to will determine the set of three naming rules that you use. So if we have an ionic compound, we have this set of three rules. To name ionic compounds, it's a fairly simple set of rules, but there's a lot that you need to know in order to be able to apply those rules. First, you simply name the cation. That's the positively charged ion. And the name of that cation may require a Roman numeral, and we will get into that later. Second, you name the anion. And third, if it is a special ionic compound, that we call a hydrate, then you have to specify which kind of hydrate it is by naming the hydrate with a Greek prefix. So again, there are three fairly simple rules, but in order to apply those rules, there's a lot that you have to know. You have to know the names of ions, particularly of the polyatomic ions. You have to recognize when a cation requires a Roman numeral in its name. You have to recognize the ions when they are in a chemical formula and they are not just written by themselves. And hopefully you recall that when ions are written in formulas and not just written by themselves, the charges are not written. And so it may be a little bit more difficult to recognize an ion when the charges are not explicitly written. We have to recognize when the compound is a hydrate. And if it's a hydrate, we have to remember the Greek prefixes or the hydrates. So in the next couple of pages we're going to cover each of these topics and then once we cover each of these topics we're going to go back to our rules, our three rules, and then apply these three rules to name ionic compounds. So first of all some basic review. Hopefully this is some basic review from your previous chemistry. To name ions remember that ions are charged particles that are made of one or more atoms and the cluster of one or more atoms has gained or lost an electron. These ions may be monoatomic, that means that they are made up of only one atom, or polyatomic, meaning that they are made up of two or more atoms. When you have a polyatomic ion and you have two or more atoms, the atoms themselves are bonded covalently together but the cluster is then an ion because the cluster has taken on a charge either by gaining or losing an electron. So again, you can have monoatomic and polyatomic ions. Ions that are made up of only a single atom that, have that has taken on a new charge or clusters of two or more atoms that have taken on a charge. So another category of ions are cations and anions. Cations are ions with positive charges. Anions are ions with negative charges. And I just want to point out this is spelled C-A-T-I-O-N-S, but it is pronounced cation. A-N-I-O-N-S, it's pronounced anion. So here are some examples. A monoatomic that is made up of a single atom, cation. So when magnesium... A single magnesium atom becomes an ion, a positive ion, then we have a monoatomic cation. 
In contrast, we can have a monoatomic anion when a single atom takes on a negative charge. Notice the mono does not refer to the charge. Mono means that there's only one atom in that species. And we can contrast this with polyatomic ions, a polyatomic cation that you'll be seeing quite a bit, is a cation that is formed when you have one nitrogen and four hydrogens in a covalently bonded cluster, and then that cluster loses an electron so that the overall cluster of atoms takes on a positive charge. So it becomes an ion because it is charged. It's a cation specifically because it has a positive charge. And it is a polyatomic cation because it has more than one atom in that species. And by contrast, a polyatomic anion. And we've seen this one before. When you have a cluster that's made up of one sulfur and four oxygens, and that cluster is covalently bonded together, and then that cluster of atoms gains two additional electrons, it becomes a polyatomic anion, which we call a sulfate. So those are just examples of monoatomic and polyatomic cations and anions. Now to name ions, it depends on whether they are monoatomic or polyatomic and whether they are cations or anions. So let's deal with the monoatomic ions first. If the ion is a monoatomic cation, for example, the sodium plus ion, then they have the same name as the neutral atom, and then we just write the word ion after it. So for example, this started out as a neutral sodium, atom, and then when it became positively charged by losing an electron, the name remains the same, sodium, and now we specify that it's an ion just by stating that it's the sodium ion. It's also common to see this referred to as the sodium cation, but that's being a little redundant because if it's a sodium ion, we know that it's a cation because sodium ions are always plus one charge. Similarly, this started out as a neutral zinc atom. Now it's an ion. We just call it a zinc ion. And finally, this started out as a neutral aluminum atom. And now that it is a monoatomic ion, we keep the neutral atom's name and just add the word ion. Now, the examples that I have given you here did not require me to use a Roman numeral in their name. And the reason that I did not have to use a Roman numeral in the name is because these are all fixed charge ions. And as you recall, a fixed charge ion, we know what the charges are without having to be told because they're always the same charge. Sodium ion is always a plus one ion. Zinc ion is always a 2 plus ion. Aluminum ion is always a 3 plus ion. So I don't have to tell my reader or my listener what the charge is on these ions because they're fixed. However, many monoatomic cations are variably charged. If the cation is a metal with a variable charge, then it has to have the charge explicitly stated. We have to tell the reader or the listener what the charge is, otherwise they won't know which ion we're talking about. And the way that we explicitly state the charge is we use a Roman numeral in parentheses as part of the cation's name. So, for example, down here I have a scandium. This started out as a scandium But scandium is not a fixed charge, so I can't just say scandium ion, because if I do that, then my reader or my listener will not know what the charge is on this ion, the way they did for the fixed charge ones. So I have to tell my reader or my listener the specific charge on this ion, and the way that I do that is in parentheses, 
I write the charge as a Roman numeral. So that's a one plus charge. So it's a scandium one ion. Now my reader or listener knows exactly which scandium ion I'm referring to. They don't have to guess what the charge is. So I have two more here. I would like for you to go ahead and complete those. Write the name, the complete name of the ions. And since these are variable, that does mean including the Roman numerals. Pause the video, finish that up, and then resume the video when you're done. All right, coming back to this video, we have Fe is an iron. But iron is a variably charged metal ion. So I have to specify that in this case, we're talking about an iron two ion. In this case, we have a gold. It's variably charged. And I have to tell my reader or my listener what the charge is. So I give it a Roman numeral three. This is a gold three ion. And there we go. So that's how we name metal cations. The monoatomic cations are either fixed or variable. If they are fixed, we never write the Roman numerals in their name. It's incorrect to write the Roman numeral in the name of a fixed charge ion. We would never write zinc 2 ion because the charge on a zinc ion is always understood. If it's variable, then we have to specify the Roman numeral to tell the reader or the listener what the charge is. Notice that the Roman numeral does not say how many ions we have in a formula. It tells us the charge on those species. Okay, moving on now, we're going to cover how to name the monoatomic anions, that is, the ions that are based on a single atom with a negative charge. And as we've discussed before, the name is based on the neutral atom and it then takes an IDE ending. So this was a nitrogen and when it gained three electrons to become an ion, a negatively charged ion, this is now the nitride. And I could leave it just as nitride but to be more thorough, I'll just include the word ion. Ion is a little bit redundant there, but we often include it in the name. That is, that is nitride, or we could say that is the nitride ion. I've got two more here. I would like for you to finish those up. Pause the video and write the names for the remaining two monoatomic anions, and then resume the video when you're finished. All right, coming back from that. So this used to be an oxygen. Takes the ox I, the IDE ending. And so now this is called an oxide. And you may have noticed that sometimes it's the last few letters of the element that are replaced with IDE. Sometimes more of the letters are eliminated and then you add IDE. So this is not oxygenide it's oxide. This is not nitrogenide, it's nitride. And the more practice that you get with those, uh, uh, you'll be able to remember them more. But I'll give you an idea here. Nitrogen becomes nitride, oxygen becomes oxide, fluoride, chloride, sulfide, phosphide, bromide, iodide, and so forth. All taking the IDE ending when a single atom has taken on one or more electrons to become a negatively charged ion. This leads us into polyatomic ions. So with polyatomic ions, you just have to know their names. There are some patterns that will help you learn many of them, but you're going to need to know 34 polyatomic ions. Thirty-four polyatomic ions that you need to know for this course. And in the next video, I'm going to go through 
the 16 fundamental polyatomic ions, which by now hopefully you have learned. And then I'm going to add on to that list. So I'm going to cover all 34 of the ions that you need to know for this class.